Hello, welcome to class 6. Today I'm going to be dealing with the subjunctive mood in English and Spanish. Overview of this class. I will start by activating your knowledge on mood and modality. Then I will move on to the subjunctive mood in Spanish. Then I will explain the subjunctive mood in English. I will round off by comparing similarities and differences between Spanish and English subjunctive mood. And finally, I will assign some practice. Last class, we reviewed the concepts of tense and aspect as two verbal categories vital to understand the system of tenses in English. Today, we are going to concentrate on mood. Mood and modality. Grimo and Quirk in a student's grammar of the English language define modality as the manner in which the meaning of a clause is qualified so as to reflect the speaker's judgment of the likelihood of a proposition. By Bretal, in Logman's student's grammar of spoken and written English, explain that in English, stance meanings related to notions of possibility, uncertainty, necessity, obligation, in a word, to epistemic and non-epistemic meanings, are mainly expressed through the use of modal verbs, semimodals, and modal idioms. El Manual de la Nueva Gramática Española states that any given proposition will not only convey information related to content, but to the attitude of the speaker. These attitudinal meanings, which denote notions of possibility, uncertainty, necessity, obligation, among others, are mainly expressed by means of the subjunctive mood in Spanish. Mood is one of the manifestations of morality. Mood reveals the attitude of the speaker towards the information given in a proposition. We can speak about three different moods in English and Spanish, but these do not always convey the same type of meanings. Indicative mood in Spanish, it's used to express facts and reality. Indicative mood in English, it's used to express facts and reality, and sometimes also hypothetical or unreal meanings. Subjunctive mood in Spanish, it's used to express meanings related to orders, hypothetical situations, likelihood and certainty, value and emotional judgments, among other meanings. Subjunctive mood in English, it's used to express meanings related to orders and hypothetical situations. Finally, the imperative mood in English and in Spanish, in both cases, it's used to give orders and commands. Subjunctive mood in Spanish. Some preliminary comments. Subjunctive means subordinate, subordinado, hence its name, modo subjuntivo. It mostly appears in subordinate or dependent clauses, triggered by lexical items known as inductores. Sometimes it can also be used in independent clauses. The subjunctive mood has traditionally been described as denoting non-factual or unreal meanings, while the indicative mood is known for conveying factual ones or real ones. The subjunctive mood, in fact, conveys a wide range of meanings, so reducing them to those under the binary opposition real and real may result in an oversimplification. A classification that contemplates other meanings is suggested by Zorrilla as subjuntivo potencial and subjuntivo optativo. But again, it does not include all possible subjunctive meanings. Therefore, when contrasting the semantic notions denoted by either the indicative or subjunctive mood, it is useful to resort to semantic oppositions such as certainty and certainty, reality and reality, commitment or non-commitment with the truthfulness of the proposition. This last binary opposition is in bold type because I think it's very important to bear it in mind. There are six tenses in the subjunctive mood in Spanish, as opposed to the ten tenses in the indicative mood. 
el presente, el pretérito perfecto compuesto, el pretérito imperfecto, el pretérito pluscuamperfecto y el futuro simple y el futuro compuesto. Uh, we have marked with an asterisk the last two uh, uses, the futures. You will see why. Because both future forms are virtually obsolete in standard Spanish, except in a few set of fixed or very flowery expressions like sea lo que fuere. However, it is frequently used in very formal registers, such as legal documents, printed regulations, charters, and similar official documents and formulas. Please notice the use of the indicative mood or modal verbs in the translations to the following sentences. Examples in printed regulations, for example, in a bet, in una apuesta, the text of a bet. ¿Se acuerda? Que el que acertare un pronóstico. Whereby it is agreed that a person who makes an accurate forecast. Or in instructions. Este mecanismo no presenta riesgo de falla. En caso de que las hubiere, this mechanism seldom presents risk of failures. If such failures should ever exist. In this case, it has been translated by means of a putative should or in legal documents, cuando los bienes se hubieren transferido, when the property has been transferred, present perfect indicative mode. Uh, let's have a look at this chart taken from la nueva gramática básica de la lengua española. It's in the material we have provided. Um, the chart indicates the correspondences of los tiempos del indicativo con los del subjuntivo. That is to say how, for example, el presente del indicativo y el futuro simple del indicativo han sido neutralizados en el presente del subjuntivo, mientras que el pretérito perfecto compuesto y el futuro compuesto han sido neutralizados por el pretérito perfecto compuesto. O sea, que a, creo que Arturo ha venido, la forma negativa que le corresponde es no creo que Arturo haya venido. O creo que Arturo habrá venido para esa hora, no creo que haya venido o llegado para esa hora. Eh, I would like to draw your attention to el pretérito perfecto compuesto because in my experience I have noticed that students um, often think or rather translate el pretérito perfecto compuesto by means of a past perfect in English instead of present perfect. Okay. Let's have an overview, a quick overview at some of the main meanings of the subjunctive tenses. Presente el subjuntivo. It may denote present and future time reference. The interpretation will depend on the adverbial of time or context. So, venga will have future time reference and no creo que Eva venga mañana, but present time reference in no creo que, ve, que Eva venga hoy. Translated by means of I don't think she's coming today or tomorrow. Cuando estés sola, me avisas. Let me know when you are alone. So it has future time reference in this subordinate adverbial clause of time, but in English it is translated by means of the indicative mode. Its morphological aspect is imperfective, just like presente del indicativo or any simple tenses in Spanish except for el pretérito perfecto simple. So, en espero que no mientas ahora, o espero que no mientas mañana en el juicio, what we can see is that mientas. Mientas, on the one hand, has imperfective morphological aspect, and we can speak about modalidad progresiva, for example, in the case of when it has present time reference. Espero que no mientas ahora, espero que no estés mintiendo. Right? Pretérito perfecto compuesto. It belongs in a present time frame. It's el de haya hecho algo. As to time reference, it can have a retrospective or prospective interpretation with respect to the moment of speaking. Notice the negative form of the retrospective interpretation. So, creo que ha cantado alguna vez en público. The negative form would be, no creo que haya cantado alguna vez en público. 
translated by means of I think she has sung or I don't think she has ever sung in public. And as to the prospective interpretation, that is to say future time reference, me jubilaré cuando una vez que haya cumplido 65 años. It has a prospective interpretation, future time reference, and it's seen as complete. I'll resign when once I have turned 65 years old, not past perfect, but present perfect. Again, notice the use of the indicative mood in the translations in English. El pretérito plus cuan perfecto compuesto hubiera o hubiese sucedido algo. This tense corresponds to the pretérito plus cuan perfecto and the conditional compuesto of the indicative mood. It has a retrospective interpretation. Now, Let's analyze these examples. The sentence, pensé que tu hijo había terminado, in the indicative mood, and pensé que tu hijo habría terminado para el mediodía, also in the indicative mood. In this case, it's conditional, conditional compuesto, and the meaning is counterfactual. Pensé que tu hijo habría terminado, it means that the, the boy did not finish. And pensé que tu hijo había terminado, also indicative mood, Pretérito plus cuan perfecto, past in the past. In the case of these two sentences, the negative form of both of them, of pensé que tu hijo había terminado y pensé que tu hijo habría eh, terminado, is no pensé que tu hijo hubiera o hubiese terminado. So it is important to notice that in Spanish there is only one possible negative form for these two sentences, though the meaning is different, right? So... In the negative form, in order to interpret one or the other meaning, of course, we will have to resort to context. Uh, however, in English, the translation would not be the same. I did not think your son had finished. I did not think your son would have finished. And the same happens in the affirmative form. I thought your son had finished. I thought your son would have finished by midday. This is very interesting, and you should really bear in mind, you should really pay attention to the type of meaning denoted by the subjunctive mood in Spanish so that you are able to make an accurate translation. Preterito imperfecto del subjuntivo. El gustara, gustase, amara, amase. This subjunctive tense corresponds um, to the preterito perfecto simple. Preterito imperfecto and conditional simply of the indicative mood. The negative form of creí que te gustó o creí que te gustaba o creí que te gustaría of any of these three forms is no creí que te gustara. While in, in English, the translation for creí que te gustó, gustaba, gustaría, I thought you liked it for gustó, gustaba or I thought you would like it. The negative form would be, I didn't think you, you liked it, or I didn't think you were going to like it, or you would like it. As you can see, there are three different forms, mm -hmm. indicative forms and a modal construction. The predictive imperfecto does not specify the time relation between the situation and the moment of speaking. The situation may be prior, simultaneous, or posterior to the moment of speaking. So, hace días que le pedí que me pagara. It could be, hace días que le pedí que me pagara hoy, o hace días que le pedí que me pagara ayer, o que me pagara mañana. In English, we would say something like, it's been some time since I asked him to pay me. To pay me today, to pay me yesterday, tomorrow. In journalistic language, it is often used instead of preterito perfecto simple for stylistic reasons. So, ayer falleció el que fuera secretario general de las Naciones Unidas. Of course, we could use indicative mode. Ayer falleció el que fue secretario. But el que fuera secretario um, adds a nuance of style. It could be translated in English by something like yesterday, the former UN Secretary General passed away. So it's indicative mode, but probably you would make a different choice of, um, 
of vocabulary, let's say. Instead of saying died, you could use passed away to try and uh, convey the same effect. Notice the use of indicative mood, modal constructions, and even infinitive forms. I ask him to pay in the translations in English. Okay. Let's have a look at el modo independiente e eh, independiente en español. In Spanish, independent clauses usually contain verbs in the indicative mood. That is to say, it's the default mood, el modo por defecto. Whereas subordinate clauses may contain verbs both in the indicative or subjunctive mood. The modo dependiente is triggered by the presence of a lexical item known in Spanish grammar as inductor or trigger in English. These words, los inductores, appear in the main clause and they can be and they can be complex prepositional phrases, verbs, adjectives, nouns, or adverbs. And depending on the meanings conveyed by them, they will trigger again the use of indicative or subjective mood. Well, let's have a look at some uh, examples of prepositional phrases in the chapter we assigned for you to read from el manual de la RAE, they are referred to as locuciones prepositivas, como con tal de que, a menos que, en vez de que, para que, o sea, con tal de que vengas, a menos de que vaya, en vez de que estudies, para que puedas, right? I'm um, sorry. Um, examples of verbs. Ordenar, dudar, desear, necesitar. Right? Ordeno que vengas, dudo que pueda. Right? O no creo, no creo que pueda, no aseguro que venga, pero aseguro que vendrá. So, in this case, it's not the type, the being of the verb, but the negation that will trigger the use of subjunctive mood. Examples of adverbs, posiblemente sea, tal vez viajen, probablemente tengan. Examples of nouns, la duda, la orden, la orden de que se vayan, la sospecha de que, no sé, de que se queden o whatever. Examples of adjectives, es necesario, es necesario que se vacune, es vital que vengas, es obligatorio que te quedes en casa. Ok. Depending on whether the mood in the subjunctive clause is mandatory or optional, we can speak about four groups. Indicativo, dependiente y obligatorio. So there's no other choice but indicativo. Subjuntivo, dependiente y obligatorio. No other choice but subjuntivo. Subjuntivo, dependiente y no obligatorio. So it means that it alternates or may alternate with indicative mood, y el subjuntivo independiente. Again, for details, for detailed examples and meanings, you should see La Nueva Gramática de la Lengua Española, chapter 25, and there you are the pages. Okay, let's have a, a, a brief um, overview of, of, of these four uh, combinations. Among the semantic notions that trigger the use of the indicative mood, we can mention lexical items that express meanings related to facts, occurrences, sensory perception or understanding or intellectual activity, certainty, communication, communication verbs or verbal processes. So, for example, sé que está feliz. Sé is a verb of intellectual activity and it's expressing a fact. Obviamente, this adverbial implies certainty, so it triggers the indicative mood. Obviamente, ella sabe la respuesta. So you could not say, obviamente, ella sepa la respuesta. That would be ungrammatical. The same as, sé que esté feliz, me, feliz de verme. It's ungrammatical. Era evidente, this time we have an adjective that again no, uh, denotes certainty. Era evidente que habían trabajado allí. You would not use subjunctive mood. Era evidente que hubiera o hubiese trabajado allí. And finally, the verb asegurar, aseguró que me ayudaría, no aseguró que me ayudara. However, if this 
was in the negative, no aseguro que me ayuda. Mm -hmm. And it would be the negative adverb no that would trigger the use of the subjunctive more. But these are instances of cases when the indicative mood is compulsory. Es dependiente y obligatorio, no hay opción. Subjuntivo dependiente y obligatorio. Ahora la única opción es el subjuntivo. Among the semantic notions that trigger the use of the subjunctive mood, we can mention lexical items that express meanings related to volition, intention, requirement, or cause, purpose, or emotional value, or value, value judgments, among others. Through the subjunctive mood, speakers often make value or emotional judgments about facts, real situations which are happening or have actually happened. The new information is not given in the subordinate clause by means of the subjunctive mood, but in the main clause. So this idea of giving new information in the main clause and the fact that in the subordinate clause you are not giving new information, you're not giving information, in fact, you're making a, a judgment on the information or you are denoting an order, is very important to understand the use of the subjunctive mood and the type of meanings it conveys. For example, me alegro, alegro is an indicative mood, so this is a fact. Me alegro de que tu jefe esté. You could also negate and say, no me alegro de que tu jefe esté. In both cases, in both the affirmative and the negative form, el jefe está. So, this is a fact. That's why here it says, through the subjunctive mode, speakers often make value or emotional judgments about facts or real situations. So, it's a fact and a real situation that the boss is there, and you are happy about that. Me alegro de que tu jefe esté aquí, o no me alegro de que tu jefe esté aquí. The same goes for, le apenaba que Antonio fuera pobre. This means that Antonio, in fact, era pobre. This is not an imaginary situation, but it's an emotional reaction to the situation. Me apenaba que fuera pobre. Many of the situations denoted by subjunctive mood are not facts. So these are facts, but now let's have a look at other examples. Many of the situations denoted by the subjunctive mood are not facts, but prospective actions. Prospective mean that they are to happen, so with future time reference, but prospective actions or states with future time reference used to express wishes, orders, purpose, the subjunctive mood seldom informs. It rather conveys shades of moral meanings. Again, this is very, very important. So, the subjunctive mood seldom informs, gives new information, but conveys shades of moral meanings. Quiero, ordeno, in indicative mood, que me digas la verdad. You cannot say, quiero ordeno que me dices la verdad. So, it, the use of the subjunctive mood is compulsory, obligatorio. La orden, this time the trigger is a noun, de que leyéramos todo, la dio la directora. You could not say la orden de que leíamos. Con tal de que, preposición eh, locutiva, perdón, locución prepositiva, or complex prepositional phrase, mm, triggers the use of the subjunctive mood. Con tal de que vengan, hago cualquier cosa. It would be ungrammatical to say, con tal de que vienen. Subjuntivo dependiente no obligatorio. That is to say, it may alternate with indicative mood. Let's see. Sometimes the same lexical item may have two different meanings. Depending on the meaning denoted, it will trigger either indicative or subjunctive mood. These cases are interesting because they clearly show the different shades of meanings denoted by each mood. We can see that the indicative mood stresses the informative value rather than judge or value the content of what has been said. Let's see what happens in subordinate noun clauses. 
when the verb in the main clause has different meanings, then it will trigger different moods. For example, the verb sentir. Sentir en sentí que lloraba, meaning escuché sensory perception. So when the verb sentir means sensory perception, escuchar, it triggers indicative mood. But when the verb sentir means to be sorry about something, lamentar, it will uh, trigger subjunctive mood, it, an emotional reaction to something. Sentí, lamenté que llorara. Que llorara, no que lloraba. Okay? The meaning would be different. With verbs of communication, for example, decir. So verbal processes. Decir, anunciar, sugerir. Les dijo que estudiaron mejor. So this is reported speech. Estudiamos mejor, les dijo que estudiaban mejor. It's information about the state of affairs. Pero les dijo que estudiaran mejor. This could be a teacher talking to his or her students. He or she requested or suggested that they should study better or more. Les dijo que estudiaran. So the meaning will, different meanings will trigger different moods. What you have to think about is the possible translations. Mm -hmm. Negation of verbs of communication or, or understanding. Creo que terminará a tiempo, presente simple del indicativo, versus no creo que termine a tiempo, presente del subjuntivo. So again, what triggers the use of the subjunctive mood in this case, it's not the, the meaning of the verb, but the negative adverb, no, the fact that the verb has been negated. So there's certainty here, but uncertainty in this other sentence. Finally, subordinate adverbial clauses of concession of the type, aunque sea rico, no me casaré con él. Aunque es rico, no me casaré con él. I'm sure that as Spanish speakers, you know these um, are not exactly the same. That it's not exactly the same meaning that these sentences convey. This is something we are going to see next week when you read the chapter by Moreno, indicativo o subjetivo en, o, o subjuntivo en oraciones concesivas. We are going to see cases like this in detail, but I invite you to start thinking about what nuance of meaning is conveyed by the subjunctive mood in, aunque sea rico, no me casaré con él, y the indicative mood in, aunque es rico, no me casaré con él. What happens with subordinate adjectival clauses? As to the mood triggering restrictive adjectival clauses, there are many cases in which both indicative and subjunctive mood are acceptable. The choice is directly related to whether the head nouns of those relative clauses have definite or indefinite reference. So now it's not only the use of mood, but also the type of noun clause uh, or noun phrase that is being modified. So, Indicative mood favors specific reference. Necesitaba un auto que tenía GPS. Entonces, que tenía GPS is the subordinate adjectival clause that post modifies the noun phrase un auto. Uh, this noun phrase is indefinite uh, reference. It has indefinite uh, reference, but it's specific. So it's a, a car, there was a car that actually had GPS. Busco una secretaria que habla francés. Same case. Una secretaria, it has indefinite reference, but it's specific because what we mean, because of the use of the indicative mood, is that this secretary exists. I actually know there is a secretary that can speak French. Busco una secretaria que habla francés. While subjunctive mood favors non-specific reference. Necesitaba un auto que tuviera GPS. So this is a hypothetical car, right? It's not 
one indefinite card in particular. It's a hypothetical one. The same as busco una secretaria que hable francés. Maybe there's no secretary speaking French in the place, right? So again, in the case of the indicative mood, the card and the secretary actually exist or existed. In the case of the subjunctive mood, the card or the secretary are hypothetical or likely to exist. What happens with the subjuntivo independent? The use of independent uh, clauses in the subjunctive mood is very restrictive. It typically appears in simple sentences that denote wishes or desires. These sentences are sometimes called oraciones desiderativas. You can read about them in chapter um, 42 of La Nueva Gramática de la Lengua Española. It is often used along with what Zorrilla in El Uso del Verbo del Gerundio en Español calls índice de actitud. So words like ojalá o the subordinating conjunction que, in this case, is not a subordinating conjunction, pero un índice de actitud. Ojalá gane la lotería, que cante otra, quizás vengan. Sometimes you may have uh, instances without an índice de actitud. Dios me salve, maldito seas, bendito seas. Finally, in the case of modal verbs in Spanish, querer, poder, deber, it often alternates with el condicional del indicativo. So we can either say, quisiera terminar pronto, o querría terminar pronto, condicional simple del indicativo. Or in a short exchange, ¿dónde está la cuchilla? Someone can ask, and the other person answers, debiera estar en el primer cajón, meaning, debería estar en el primer cajón. Ok. If you want to take a rest, you can stop this recording, have a break, <laughs> and come back. If not, we have like 10 more minutes, which I'm going to devote to the subjunctive mood in English. Okay. Main features. The subjunctive mood in English is a stylistically marked variant of other constructions less frequently used than the indicative mood, but not less important. It is frequently found in dependent clauses, but like in Spanish, it also admits its use in independent clauses. There are two tenses in the subjunctive mood in English, the present and the past or were subjunctive. Both present and past subjunctive forms are recognizable only in the third person singular form. That is to say, it is evident that the sentence is in the subjunctive mood if the subject is a third person singular, he, she, it. Why? Due to the fact that the base form of the verb, of any verb, go, like, well, in the case of be, be, and the where form are used with all persons. So, here you are a chart with the overview of the subjunctive tenses in English, present and past, present, subjunctive put, subdivided into mandative and formulaic, and past or where subjunctive. The present subjunctive. According to Greenbaum and Quirk, we can distinguish two main uses of the present subjunctive, mandative and formulaic. The mandative subjunctive is used in subordinate nominal that clauses with the verb in its base form. It is triggered by lexical items that denote notions of demand, recommendation, proposal, intention. So in this respect, it resembles Spanish. So which could be the triggers? Verbs like decide, insist, prefer, request, adjectives, necessary, it is necessary, it is vital, desirable, nouns, the decision, the requirement, the resolution. Let's analyze the following examples. The boss decided, this is the main clause, that his secretary take care of the new clients. This is the subordinate noun clause. It's a direct object, a subordinate noun clause, direct object. The subjunctive mode is obvious here because his secretary is third person singular and take is in, it, 
in its base form instead of with the final S. It is triggered by the verb decided in the main clause. The boss decided that his secretary take care of the new clients. It can also be triggered by a noun. The decision that she take care of the new clients was not a good one. Or it may be triggered by an adjective. The boss said, it's vital, it's imperative that she take care of the new clients. This use is more frequent in American English. In British English, alternatives are putative should and indicative mood. That is to say things like, it's vital or it's imperative that she takes care or that she should take care of the new clients. Something important for you to remember is that the base form has both present and past time reference. So if here it said the, the boss decides or will decide that his secretary take care, take um, will have present or past time reference. In this example, because I've decided, it has past time reference. If you wanted to express the same meaning by means of the indicative mood, you would say something like, the boss decided that his secretary took care of the new clients. If you go for putative should, the boss decided that his secretary should take care. The present subjunctive uh, may also be used in informal English, in adverbial clauses of condition. So not only noun clauses, subordinate noun clauses, direct object, but in adverbial clauses of condition, of concession, or of negative purpose. For example, if that be your final word, I will resign. That's an adverbial clause of condition. If that be, if that is, or negative purpose. Authorities must, there's a mistake here, Authorities must allow for more flexibility, lest the situation cause violence. Negative purpose. Instead of causes, you use the base. With all verbs except be, the verb phrase is made negative by placing not before the verb. It's essential that the plan not fail. Or in the indicative mood, that the plan does not fail. But with the verb to be, you have mobility of the particle not. The committee order that the elections not be carried out. The committed order that the elections be not carried out. The present subjunctive is clearly marked as distinct from the indicative mood in the third person singular. When the base form can be classified as both indicative or subjunctive, Greenbaum et al. say there is neutralization of the two moods. That is to say, in a sentence like the government's order is that people remain at home, remain could be either in the indicative or subjunctive mood. Why? Because the subject is plural, people. So we say that here two moods have been neutralized because of the meaning, and you may say it's either indicative or subjunctive. Now, if it were in the negative, there would be no there would be no ambiguity. The government's order is that people not go out. This is only subjunctive mode. The formulaic subjunctive is equivalent to the independent subjunctive in Spanish. That is to say, it is used in simple sentences and the finite verb is generally in its base form. It is largely reduced to fixed expressions. So fixed expressions like, suffice it to say that you have been accepted for the job. Suffice, it would be, it suffices to say, it's enough to say. Basta con decir o baste con decir, this is its base form. Or be noted that this offer was sincere. Come what may, I'll not leave you alone. Pase lo que pase. In this case, come is not in its base form because of the presence of the modal auxiliary may, because it would, it's um, an alternative to may come. Whatever may come, so come would be a very infinitive. But anyway, this is taken as a formulaic subjunctive. The past or where subjunctive. 
The past subjunctive is also known as where subjunctive. It is hypothetical or unreal in meaning. It is restricted to the one form where and thus breaks the conquer rule of indicative mode. The where subjunctive may be used as a subjunctive auxiliary in the progressive form and in passive constructions. My neighbor always plods back home as if he were tired. My neighbor always plods back home as if he was tired. I'm conveying exactly the same meaning, but this time I'm using the indicative mode. In this case, we do not speak of neutralization of the modes like in, in the cases before, in the cases of the present subjunctive. This is indicative mode with no doubt. I wish the quarantine were over, subjunctive mode, or I wish the quarantine was over, indicative mode. In expressions like as it were, which means so to speak, or if I were you, these expressions do not admit the alternative indicative form. So you will rarely hear things like if I was you. As it was, never. And if I was you, it's really very rare. Other constructions that translate as subjunctive mood in Spanish. Well, for example, may. Greenbaum and Quirk speak of a tendency of certain models to develop as pragmatic particles. A clear example is the fronting of the model may to express a wish, which is often translated as cases of independent subjunctive in Spanish. For example, uh, from the film The Hunger Games, may the odds be ever in your favor. Que la suerte esté siempre de tu lado. So, this construction is translated by means of an independent subjunctive in Spanish. Que la suerte esté siempre de tu lado. Let, in open let imperative. Let is used in imperative-like sentences of the kind of proclamations that only a sovereign or an authority figure is allowed to make. This type of construction has no specific addressee. So, God in the Bible said, let there be light, que se haga la luz. Or in, you might hear a politician saying in a speech, let the world take notice of what is really happen, happening. Que el mundo se entere de lo que realmente sucede o está sucediendo. Finally, putative should. It conveys the notion of a situation presented as possibly existing or coming into existence. That is to say, again, epistemic morality. She insisted that we should stay. Insistió en que nos quedáramos. Careful, do not translate this should as if it had non-epistemic or deontic morality. It's not insistió en que nos deberíamos quedar. No, en que nos quedáramos. Mm -hmm. Okay, to sum up. Let's have a look at some differences and similarities between subjunctive mood in English and in Spanish. Differences. In Spanish, there are six subjunctive, subjunctive tenses, while in English, there are two. In Spanish, the subjunctive mood is frequently used in both formal and informal register. We use it all the time. In English, the subjunctive mood is not as frequently used as in Spanish. It is used in all varieties of, of Spanish alike. In English, is more typical in American English than in British English. Stance meanings related to notions of possibility, uncertainty, necessity, obligation are mainly expressed by means of the subjunctive mood. This is a very, a very important difference. That's why there are so many tenses in the subjunctive mood in Spanish, because we use it all the time and to express many nuances of meanings. In English, stance meanings related to notions of possibility, uncertainty, necessity, obligation are mainly expressed through the use of the indicative mood, as we have seen in this presentation, but mainly by means of modal verbs, semi-modals, and modal idioms. No wonder in English modal verbs are an issue. 
and in every grammar course you will have units devoted to the study of modal verbs. Similarities. Well, in both languages, the subjunctive mood is used in subordinate clauses and it may be used in, the, in independent clauses. Okay, um, I leave here an exercise for you to do and to solve for Friday in class. So after I hope you have read all the material we assigned, and after reading the material, you should uh, listen to this presentation. And after that, you are in a position to decide whether these statements are correct, incorrect, and explain why. Another assignment for Friday is an exercise we have in our Manual de Cátedra, uploaded in our virtual classroom. By the way, uh, you can read about subjunctive mood in pages on pages 120 through to 123 where you have this exercise so i would like you to take your time and also speak about this in class go back to the meanings and uses of the subjunctive mood in spanish and explain where the humor of this cartoon lies this is the bibliography again the topic is very complex and long, so I have just um, chosen the most important points that uh, will help you or for our subject, but you must read the chapters on your own. Thank you.